Well, thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's a nice looking crowd. <laughs> I think if we laugh enough, the people from the other panel will think we're having a better time and they'll come over here. <laughs> so I, I was hoping today that we would open by talking about and considering a philosophical question. I know it's still kind of early, so if you haven't had enough caffeine, just skip this part. But the rest of us, let's think about sacrifice. We know about sacrifice. We all make them to achieve larger goals. Like time, you sacrifice time all the time, right? Your friends are going to the squama kit, but you stay home to polish the presentation because you really want to get a promotion at work. But what if reaching your goals required you to sacrifice something bigger, like a part of yourself? How much of yourself? So the very essence of who you are would you be willing to trade to achieve your life ambition? So the journalist I wrote about in The Imposter's War, John Ratham, traded everything, his whole self, to get what he wanted. So let's put a pin in that question, we'll come back to that. So the, the era of American history in which Ratham was famous is the early 20th century in World War I. Now, the way the United States got into the First World War is very different than the way we got into the Second. In World War II, America was shocked into the war by Pearl Harbor, a sudden galvanizing event for the nation. World War I was more of a slow slot. There was no one big definitive event, but an accumulation of things. And when the war started in 1914, most Americans wanted to stay far away from it. There's no need to risk our sons in a war in Europe. We have wars all the time. So the Imposters' War is the true story of one of history's great imposters, John Revelstoke Ratham. Not that that was his real name. With equal parts grit, talent, and shamelessness, Ratham became one of the most influential characters in America's slide into World War I, and I would argue, the most confoundingly fascinating Rhode Islander of all time. In his younger days, he was a liar, a philanderer, and an occasional extortionist, as well as a journalist. When World War I broke out in Europe, he was also editor of the Providence Journal where in fact I worked from 1998 to 2008, and where I met my wife. <laughs> Ratham published sensational original scoops about German espionage in the United States. His direct audience was really small, only about 25,000 people read the journal every morning. But his work was republished word for word in newspapers in every state soon making Ratham the most famous newsman in America. The editor of the Promise Journal was the most famous newsman in America in this period. The New York Times published many of his scoops the same day they appeared in the journal, and many of those on the front page, too. They're, the New York Times would add an opening line ahead of the story that would just say, the Providence Journal will say today, then Ratham's story, word for word, would follow. Yeah his name, and almost all of this famous newsman's personal biography was entirely made up. He told people he was a native of Australia, which was the one true thing he said about himself. He claimed to have attended schools, which in fact had never heard of him. He said he was a war correspondent for newspapers that have no record of him. The people he claimed were his parents, in fact, never existed. The woman he introduced as his wife was, in fact, not his spouse. Once the imposter stepped into the made-up identity of John Revelstoke Ratham, he never stepped out of character for the rest of his life. At the height of his fame, around 1918, Ratham was a confidant of President Woodrow Wilson. He was trusted by millions of American newspaper readers. And there is no evidence he ever spoke his real name on this continent. 
So that is what I meant about sacrificing part of yourself to achieve your ambition. If the imposter wanted to stand on the brightest stages of American civic life, he needed a costume to hide who he really was. So what did he accomplish under this fake identity? By 1915, as editor of the journal, Raytheon became convinced that the German Empire was a threat to the United States, and a threat that the U.S. should forcefully confront. He wanted the U.S. to join the war on the side of Great Britain and its allies, primarily France and Russia. Raytheon saw America's reluctance to get into this war as another enemy to defeat. And he set out to grind down this reluctance one new story at a time. His story accused German, German diplomats in America of propaganda, among many other things, trying to influence American public opinion in underhanded ways, uh, included by secretly paying for news articles that were favorable to Germany. The Germans also established fake citizens groups in the U.S. to organize unwitting Americans into pressure groups that Germany funded and controlled. It was sort of the low-tech version of what the Russians are doing to us right now, with a bunch of guys in St. Petersburg up in the middle of the night typing fake Twitter and Facebook posts to try to rile up Americans and keep us at each other's throats. Raytheon accused German diplomats in the U.S. of passport fraud, of conspiring to undermine U.S. banks and weapon makers, trying to instigate labor strikes to damage U.S. industry and shipping. So how did he get these stories? He would lie about this later, but he developed some valuable sources. One was the British government, and Raytheon was born a British subject because Australia was a dominion of Britain, of Great Britain at the time. Great Britain secretly leaked information to Raytheon that its spies and code breakers had developed about German espionage. The British also connected Raytheon with a domestic spy ring of immigrants who had come from Austria-Hungary, which was one of Germany's primary ally in World War I. And these folks wanted Austria-Hungary to lose the war because they were hoping their native regions back in Europe could be independent nations uh, in a peace settlement. So they infiltrated German and Austrian consulates in the United States, usually by taking jobs as office workers, stenographers, janitors, so they could eavesdrop on conversations, rifle through the trash, steal documents, copy diplomatic cables. Raytheon leaned really heavily on these, on these people. And his other major source was a guy named Bruce Velasquez, who was the director of a new agency in the Department of Justice, which we now call the FBI. And a lot of information and rumor went back and forth between Ratham and Velasquez until the Department of Justice eventually turned on Ratham. So many of Ratham's allegations in his stories, I was able to confirm. They were true or true-ish. Right, none of the stories were ever perfect, and they would not pass muster under today's journalistic standards that uh, a place like the Boston Globe, where I work now, that we follow. However, to the degree I was able to reverse engineer his stories and figure out where they came from, they usually did begin with a kernel of truth, which you know, I found really surprising. When I get into this book, I thought Raytheon was a fabulous. I thought everything that he wrote was made up. And it was not the case. It was a Interesting surprise. In his greatest story, he named a diplomat named Karl Boye, who was the German naval attaché stationed in the United States, as the point man in a German plot to instigate a shooting war between the U.S. and Mexico so that America would not be able to sell ammunition to Great Britain because we would need it here at home. This was in 1915. Germany denied every word of it. But two years later, the infamous Zimmerman telegram was intercepted by the British, decoded and leaked in the United States to the Associated Press. And it showed that Germany was trying to engineer a shooting war between the US and Mexico. 
So what Ratham had outrageously alleged in 1915 was proven true two years later. The German ambassador wrote directly to the U.S. Secretary of State to complain about one journalist in America, John Ratham, the editor of the Providence Journal, and to ask the U.S. government to rein him in, or at least put out a press release saying the government does not support Ratham's allegation. Instead, the government kicked out the diplomats who were implicated in Ratham's stories. And that made John Ratham a household name across the United States. So now, 100 years later, why is it we've never heard of him if he was so famous in his time? I would say, remember that Ratham was an actor playing a role. He was already lying about the most fundamental things about himself, his very identity. And it was a small leap to lying about his work. In 1917, after Ratham got what he wanted, and the U.S. declared war on Germany, Ratham went on kind of a victory tour, giving speeches in major cities. Boston, New York, Toronto, Detroit, Chicago, Philadelphia. The tour was a complete smash. People wanted to hear from the editor who had the nickname the German Spy Hunter. Huge crowds turned up. And Ratham electrified those crowds by claiming, falsely, that he had gotten all those sensational news scoops by developing his own reporters as kind of a counter-spy strike force. He said his people infiltrated German consulates to steal documents and eavesdrop on conversations. Now, spies did do those things, but not rate them as reporters. He said the journal's own wireless radio station on Block Island had intercepted German communications and that the journal itself had decoded them. And that was actually done by the British government. The U.S. government knew that Ratham's self-aggrandizing tales were fiction because in some cases he was taking credit for work done by the Department of Justice. That annoyed them. Another thing that annoyed the government, in every city in which Ratham spoke, he warned that that particular city was more infiltrated by German spies than any place he'd ever been. <laughs> And that did not reflect well on the department whose job it was to round up spies, Department of Justice. By late 1917, the federal government had had it up to here with John Ratham, despite having shared information with him for uh, two years. The Attorney General of the United States personally ordered that the FBI take steps to shut up this loudmouth newsman in Providence. The first step was to subpoena Ratham to a grand jury, to ask him under oath, county of perjury in jail, about his tall tales about defeating German spies, with the intention of making the transcript public so Ratham would be ruined. Obviously, Ratham was desperate not to do this, desperate not to testify. He begged to get out of the subpoena, and the Attorney General's price to get out of testifying was really harsh. Ratham would have to sign a letter confessing his falsehoods. The Attorney General would hold that letter in confidence. It would remain secret if Ratham behaved himself and watched his mouth. And the Attorney General would release it if, the, if Ratham offended the government again. In short, the Attorney General of the United States of America, Thomas Watt Gregory, blackmailed a celebrity newsman into signing away his right to speak freely. The DOJ did the legal equivalent of dangling Ratham upside down off the balcony. And seeing no other alternative, Ratham signed the confession. Things were calm for more than a year. The US and the Allies won the World War. Ratham behaved. But silence was not his nature. In 1920, Ratham's returned from his government-imposed sabbatical from rabble rousing, brought him into conflict with one of the biggest figures in American political history. It was a controversy that started in Newport, Rhode Island. I should just say, 
This is going to sound like I'm making this up. I'm not. <laughs> there was a Navy base there. Obviously, there still is. But in 1919 and 1920, the base was overflowing with tens of thousands of sailors who had been drafted in the run-up to the war. And these young bellbottoms really let loose. And they turned Newport into a pretty wild party town. And inside this thrumming social scene, gay men who had been drafted from around the country, many of whom may have grown up thinking they were alone in the world, began to find each other and create their own social scene. Now, Navy brass were concerned about this. In a primitive era, when gay people were routinely, routinely arrested, tried, prosecuted as sex criminals, and put into prison. So a small group of officers came up with an action plan that is almost too stupid for words. It was a sting operation. They recruited handsome young sailors, had to be handsome, many of whom were still in their teens, 18, 19 year old men, and sent them out as undercover operatives in the gay social scene. And to gather ironclad evidence of sex crimes, these young sailors would go to bed with the men who picked them up, and then afterwards take down their names for arrest and prosecution. This thing was known as Section A of the Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. And who was the Assistant Secretary at the time? That was an up-and-coming Democratic politician by the name of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Yes, that guy, FDR. The guy on the dime. <laughs> that was the guy in charge of this. This was before he was governor of New York, before four victorious presidential campaigns, before polio. When the tactics of Section A became public, largely through the efforts of John Ratham, Ratham would, uh, FDR would claim he had no idea how the team had gathered evidence of sex crimes. After looking into it for a bit, I find that very hard to believe. Eventually, the sting expanded to the civilian population and entrapped an Episcopal, Episcopal priest by the name of Sam Kent. He was tried for sex crimes in the federal building in, in the courthouse in downtown Providence in January of 1920. The tactics of accumulating evidence of Section A were revealed in his testimony, and Ratham and a whole lot of other people went bananas. Ratham wrote volcanic editorials against the Navy officers he thought were responsible, especially Franklin Roosevelt. FDR denied Ratham's charges, and the national press fanned their spat into a clash of titans, the celebrity journalist against this up-and-coming Democratic politician. Ratham demanded a congressional investigation into Section A, and he got one. The U.S. Senate designated a subcommittee to investigate, and that committee would eventually pin much of the blame on Roosevelt. Now, FDR at this time had other things on his mind. This was 1920, and that year he was the Democratic's nom Democratic Party's nominee for vice president on a ticket with uh, John Cox, the governor of Ohio. And since no one of you ever heard of President Cox, they obviously lost. <laughs> Uh, but John Cox's business ventures exist to this day, and there are probably Rhode Islanders right now on hold trying to talk to someone from Cox Communication. <laughs> <laughs> One of his business legacies. So the fight over this Newport scandal cropped up occasionally during the campaign, sort of like low, simmering background noise. But that October, a week before the election, and what is now known as an October surprise, Ratham attacked Roosevelt with a long list of charges, mostly related to court martial sailors that FDR had permitted back to service after they had served time in the brig. And there was a really big debate at the time whether or not letting uh, criminals who had paid their sentence 
fact that the Navy corrupted the moral fiber of the Navy. Uh, but the big part of this was that Braytham accused FDR of destroying evidence, which after looking into it, I don't think was true, but it was really serious. That was a felony, and that's a big deal a week before the election, when one of America's most famous newsmen accuses the vice presidential nominee of a felony. Maybe it wouldn't be such a big deal now. <laughs> At the time, it was a big deal. <laughs> Roosevelt immediately filed a $500,000 civil suit against Raytham, very public, huge headlines, and asked the Department of Justice to prosecute Raytham for criminal libel. So the DOJ looked into that, couldn't figure out a way to prosecute him, but these were partisans, they had another idea. To defend Roosevelt and the presidential ticket, from Ratham's allegations. They released Ratham's secret confession to the press. All the lies he told on his speaking tour were revealed, and in his own words, in a signed and notarized statement. Ratham's reputation shattered. Now, books written about World War I before Ratham was exposed are really generous to him. Uh, they give him a lot of credit and say that maybe even the course of the world might be different had it not been for the efforts of the Problems Journal in, in smoking out German espionage in this country. Well, again, you got too much credit there because a lot of that, he did print stories about it, but he didn't do the work. Spies did that and they leaked the information to him. So that wasn't entirely fair. Books printed after his uh, uh, he was exposed, either don't include him at all or dismiss his stories as sort of the figment of a romantic imagination. And that's not really fair either. But the lies he told on the speaking tour had poisoned everything that he had ever done. And there was sort of a rough justice in that. It wasn't entirely fair. But public liars used to pay a really high price in this country. You know, and we don't really punish public lives anymore. And because of that, we don't really know who to trust. So the writers of history passed on Ratham the most severe sentence that, at their disposal. They left him out. And his contributions, substantial as they were, to combating propaganda and influence American public thinking before World War I uh, were lost. So I just want to, I just have four telling facts about John Ratham that I'd like to, I'd like to just give you those and then I'd love to take questions. So, um, as a 20 year old newspaper reporter, the imposter left Australia in 1888, spent some time in British Hong Kong, and then arrived in British Columbia in Western Canada in 1889. So the moment he walked off the ship, the imposter slipped into the fake identity of John Revelstoke Raven, and he never broke character for the rest of his life. There is no evidence that the woman he married in British Columbia, a school teacher named Mary Crockford, ever knew her husband had a fake identity. I mean, who, who could imagine that? Who could imagine marrying an imposter? He worked as a reporter in Victoria, British Columbia. Um, this is, in his early days, he was uh, also a thief and an extortionist. He had this little scam he used to run, where he would write a really derogatory story about someone in town, usually someone affluent with money, and he would bring them the story, unpublished, and say, look at this horrible story I've written about you. I'm sure this would humiliate you if you see this in print, but for a small fee, I can sand off some of these sharper edges, and for a larger sum, I'll just throw it away, and we'll pretend it never happened. So he pulled that scheme a few times, got away with it a number of times, even though his bots would suspect he was doing things like this, until he pushed it one time too many, and the police were on his tail. He escaped uh, over the ferry into uh, the United States, just ahead of the chief of police who was coming to arrest him for extortion. So he could really know, never go back to British Columbia after that. Mm -hmm. So he worked around the Pacific Northwest, he worked in uh, Washington, <laughs> worked in uh, Oregon, uh, where he got fired for sort of the same kind of scheming, and then ended up at the San Francisco Chronicle. Now, as you can imagine, he was, as an employee, a total handful. And how did he keep getting 
opportunities in journalism if he was uh, if he was being fired regularly for uh, for getting in this kind of trouble. And the reason is he was a spectacular writer and storyteller. He was wonderful, and that's why he got chance after chance in journalism. <laughs> and I just like to uh, I'm going to throw it, to read you just a passage that I quote in the book that, um, that Ratham wrote. So in 1898, he was dispatched with some other reporters from the Chronicle to uh, Cuba to cover the Spanish-American War. So he wrote this um, after the Battle of San Juan Hill, which he witnessed. Um, he wrote this the night of July 3rd, which is the day before his 30th birthday. And it's four or five paragraphs. I'm just going just gonna to read it and get a sense of how Ratham wrote. <coughs> Overhead is the typical Cuban sky, black as jet, studded with thousands of stars. The full moon floods everything with its soft light, making the hills and valleys around our trenches as bright as they were at noon and throwing back the white glitter of the roofs of Santiago like long beacon gleams right in front of us. Below at the bottom of the ridge, constant dull sounds and the flash of picks through the air tell us that our men are engaged in burying their comrades. I want to write tonight of our wounded, the Red Cross hospitals, and the method that so far in this campaign characterized the medical arm of the service. This picnic war, this summer holiday, as some of our all-seeing legislators characterized it before the army left Tampa, has already brought death and desolation to many American homes. I wish some of these men, who for months reviled our president for his refusal to rush into battle, who talked of taking Havana with 5,000 men, could see what I have seen in the past three days. Is there any sight, I wonder, more depressing in its effect more lasting in its memories or more heartrending than a field hospital hastily erected in the wake of an army. Men, strong, full of young manhood, bunches of vitality and enthusiasm, march along a winding bog to where the enemy waits for them. The crack of gatlings, the whistle of Mauser bullets, the shriek of the devilish shell and shrapnel fill the air, and the gray-faced doctors and Red Cross nurses make ready quietly, but with business-like activity, for what they know will come back by that country road. So, I spent a lot of time reading newspaper articles uh, of Raven's day, and, um, and I find the writing now, from a modern perspective, to be really stilted. This is not, this feels really modern to me, the way he wrote it. It's not written like a traditional news story, it's sort of more of a column. And it has uh, a certain amount of um, pain and rage, I think, in it. And uh, I just find it really beautiful. Um, another passage that Ratham wrote uh, that also really connected to me is uh, 1903, the Iroquois Theater burned down in Chicago. He was a feature writer uh, for the Chicago Record Herald at the time. And 602 people died in that fire. It was still the deadliest single building fire in American history. Um, I can remember when I covered the station nightclub fire here for the Province Journal. We looked up one of the deadliest building fires, and that was still number one. And Ratham was uh, in charge that day of taking the feeds from all the different reporters who were calling in little scraps of news stories from all over the city, from the scene, from the hospitals, from the morgue, uh, from the mayor's office, with the police and the fire captains. And that all information was coming in. It his, his, was his job to not only write a story that told you what happened, but to fashion all those feeds into a story that could convey the emotional power of what it felt like to be in Chicago on that day during that tragedy. And I know very much what that was like because I did that job for the Boston Globe when the Boston Marathon was bombed. And feeds were coming in from all over the state. Um, overwhelming number of feeds from reporters all over the state. I had trouble keeping up with them, and it's pretty intimidating to think that you know what I'm sitting here to write is going to be in a history book. And I can tell you that nothing you type feels like uh, big enough to do justice to the moment. Editors are walking around; their eyes are huge. They're terrified. They're just like 
you can feel their you can feel their stress, and they're just like, give us something to read, give us anything to read. Um, so I felt real kinship with Braith when I first saw those words that he wrote about the Chicago Fire, and, 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 and he wrote it brilliantly, absolutely brilliantly. So that's uh, two. That's the second uh, telling fact about John Ratham. He's a beautiful writer. The third telling fact of about John Ratham is that his mistress, a woman named Florence, tried to steal Ratham from his wife Mary by framing Mary for attempted murder. Mm -hmm. And it sort of worked. <laughs> uh, it was 1899. Ratham was uh, at the time uh, still a reporter at the Chronicle in San Francisco. And at the time, the nation was mesmerized by a trial, which was sort of the OJ trial of its day. It was a trial of a San Francisco woman, and her name was Cordelia Botkin, who was convicted of murder after sending her lover's wife a box of poison candy through the mail. From San Francisco, she murdered a woman in Delaware by mailing her a box of poison candy. Uh, at this time, you know, Ratham had moved out on his wife, and he had shacked up with his mistress, Florence, sort of just around the corner. Uh, at first, you know, Florence and Mary <laughs> were not enemies. They had been friends, and they had exchanged a lot of friendly letters between them. Even after Ratham walked out on her, Mary really blamed Ratham for the affair, not so much Florence, and was still cordial with Florence, uh, until at one point, um, you know, her patience eventually just ran out, and she demanded that Florence break off the affair, or she was going to file the divorce and name Florence as a co-respondent, which would out her as an adulteress. Just after that, Florence received in the mail a little blue package tied up with white string. She unwrapped in the presence of her landlady and some other of her landlady's friends and family members. And inside the package was a little wicker basket, and in the wicker basket was a pound and a half of candied cherries. And so she ate some, and her landlady ate some, and the landlady's husband made a joke like, Don't you, haven't you been reading the news? Don't you know you're not supposed to eat candy that comes from the mail from strangers? And they're like, well, it's not from strangers. I mean, there's no return address on the package, but the handwriting on the, on the outside of the package was clearly Mary Ratham's, clearly Mary Ratham's handwriting. Although oddly, it seemed that the address had been cut off another envelope and pasted onto the package. So that night, everyone who had candy got really, really sick. Uh, so much so that Ratham took the candies to a chemist that had them analyzed and made for, as the chemist said, enough arsenic to kill a herd of cows. That's when the police got involved, and they're like, another poison candy attempted murder? Uh, it took, uh, this became a national news story. Uh, the New York Times wrote about this. Newspapers in every state picked up the wire stories about this. Uh, the Chronicle and its com competitors in San Francisco blew out their front page about this story. The newsman, his wife, the mistress, and the poison cherries. It was a made-for-tabloid TV story, but the reporters of the late 19th century definitely did their best with it. After a few weeks, the police, through some, I think some pretty good, just gumshoe police work, invited Florence <coughs> back for more questioning at the uh, police station. And waiting for her was the clerk who sold her the poison, and another clerk who sold her the wicker basket to put this yeah. package together. And Florence was outed as the perp. Under harsh questioning, she cried, "Yes, I sent the poison to myself." because I was trying to frame Mary Ratham so she wouldn't, so I'd have something over her so she wouldn't use my name in the divorce filing. The police sent all the evidence they had to the district attorney who threw up his hands and said, it's not illegal to mail arsenic to yourself. <laughs> Florence had thought she had been safe because she only ate the candies at the top until uh, she realized uh, after eating some, boy, they, they got mixed up in transit, uh, and then she started to panic, and then she started to feel sick. Um, so whether she ate a small amount of poison or it was all in her mind, um, that's, that's unsure. But um, uh, what's definitely sure is after that, Florence and Ratham had to leave San Francisco, and they started working their way east, first in Chicago, and then eventually they ended up in Providence. So, that was, so the fourth... Um, Telling fact about John Ratham 
is that he died in 1923, shortly after his, his humiliating fall from grace and his exposure. He was 56, and he left no known children. He's buried at Swamp Point in an unmarked grave. There's no stone. I've been there. Why? I can only guess that after living the last 30 years of his life as someone he wasn't, the imposter did not want to repose forever beneath a lie. Um, so thank you for uh, listening, and uh, would love to take some questions. Yes? Uh, well, I first I first heard about Ratham um, when I was working at the Providence Journal. Uh, when I was there in 2004, it was the journal's 175th birthday. And I was on a team of reporters, and we were working on a special section of journal history. And, of course, like, you know, Ratham is a huge part of journal history, so that's where I really learned about him and got fascinated by him. And I remember going back and looking, like, okay, so what did they do? 25 years ago, the 150th anniversary, so we get some idea of like how to, how to, I don't know, how do you write about the history of the newspaper? So we went back and looked at what they did. And so in the late 1970s, the 150th anniversary, those guys fell head first into the Raven Vortex. They were fascinated by it. No one who worked on that project was still alive at the time. Um, so we, but we were left with you know, what they had written. And, and you know, to their credit, they, they were able to figure out, without the databases that I had available to me now, they were able to figure out that was probably not his real name. He was probably not born to that name. So uh, I was able to stand on the, on the shoulders of the people who came before me, uh, confirm his real name through you know, a, a ton of research. Um, uh, but at the time, we did as best we could writing about Raven for the paper then uh, I thought it should be a book. And I, I had that in my head for uh, 15 years. And then in 2018, I did a short little piece on Ratham for a live uh, storytelling show that the Boston Globe does called Globe Live. We're in the theater district. We rent a theater, sell tickets, and the reporters report original stories, and they come and they just kind of like this. They're at a microphone, and I'm telling this story to this you know, big theater. And I did a, uh, I've done it a few times, and I did one of the ones I did was on Raven. Just one little, just a little bit about him and FDR. A little, one little, little slice of Raven's scandal-filled life, and people really loved it, and it really went over big. So I mean, that got me thinking I should really turn this into a book. I worked on the proposal in 2019, and then the pan I sold the proposal, and the pandemic hit, and then this was my pandemic project. I wrote it in 2020 and 2021. I finished it. Mid 21. Uh, so, I mean, I guess if you count the 15 years that was it was tumbling around in my head, it took a long time. But uh, the actual reporting and writing the book, about two years. Yeah. Anything else? I'm, yeah, yeah, do you see any. Um, so, I love the bookmark, really. Thank you. And, um, but do you see any similarities between Rafa? and any present-day media celebrities, whether newspaper, TV, radio, anybody who has that kind of power? I don't see anyone with that kind of power. I would think that in order to find like a modern equivalent to Ratham, you would have to put a bunch of people together. In one sense, he was an establishment news figure. He was like Jake Tapper, right? In another sense, he was a spy. No, I'm, you know, I don't know any spies, but uh, so, and then in another sense, he was a bit of a dirty trickster, maybe more like a, um, a less malevolent Roger Stone. So I think if you were to put these three Much people less. together, you might, you might get, you might get something approximate, approximate great, but I don't think that there's a media figure with this kind of power now, considering that, you know, media is fractured, more fractured, uh, diffuse than it used to be. That you spit. Yes. Did you come across any indication that he kept in touch, or like tried to keep in touch with his family in any way back in Australia? I've made 
contact, and working on the book, I made contact with uh, Ratham's uh, family in Australia. Just, he didn't have any direct descendants, but this is his distant family in Australia. I should say, why Ratham, why the imposter chose a new identity, I do explain in the book. I don't think it's fair to tell you now for people who haven't read the story uh, and, and want to have that want to have that surprise. But I but I did I did confirm his real name and why he uh, why the imposter chose to become to live the rest of his life as John Raven. And I also did connect with kind of by luck with his distant family in Australia. They live around the Adelaide and Melbourne area in Southern Australia. And uh, they're like my mates now. And um, they were enormously helpful with a lot of uh, family information that I don't know how I ever would have gotten otherwise. And uh, I spoke at their family reunion on Zoom. <laughs> it was the middle of the night for me. <laughs> I stayed up in the middle of the night and spoke at their family reunion. So um, uh, and I, I'm very hopeful to be able to go there and meet them at some point. Yeah, something else? Uh, anyone else? All right, well, I would just say that um, you know, the, I'll be in the ballroom. Please come find me. You know, the book. You know, the book is there. Um, the book is. You know, I think it's really fun, and I, I do think you'll enjoy it. If you are able to read it either here or, or later, it's really helpful. Word of mouth is still really important for book sales. If you can post a review if you like it, um, if you could tell your friends if you like it, put it on social media. And, yeah. I have a question. If if he were alive now. What would he think of the type of media and reporting that the reporters are reporting? Uh, I well, one funny thing about that is, um, you know, Ratham's work was not what we would call objective. Now, right? He was his work was anti-German, period, and he didn't pretend otherwise. He didn't write about he wrote about German efforts to influence American public opinion and hurt American industry. He didn't write about British efforts to influence American public opinion. He was kind of part of those. Uh, but as a reader, you priced his anti-German sentiment into what you read. So you knew that going in. Like, I'm reading this from Braithen, he's the German spy hunter. You know, it's not going to be pro-German. Um, but the, the, um, the standard then was not objectivity. The standard was truth. So you could write, you could be anti-German if you're writing what's true. I feel like now there is a lot, especially in TV, there's a lot of, well, we'll just report all sides of an issue just in case one of them might be true. Okay. And uh, I think that um, there's, especially in political reporting, there's too much stenography now, just reporting this is what people said and not enough actual journalism, you know, the, the act of seeking truth, not of journalism applied to um, you know, public statements or things that, especially people in politics, say, I think we could um, certainly do a lot of better, a lot better on that. Yeah. So again, if you like the book, please you know post a review. If you don't like the book, please keep that to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.